Well, good morning again, everyone. I think we should get ourselves uh, moving with this hot topic. We have uh, about 55 minutes to get through this now, so uh, if everyone can take a seat and make yourself comfortable. I'm endlessly impressed, endlessly impressed that on a Sunday morning, after an evening like last evening, we have such a full house audience. This is really remarkable. And I think in our experience of the World Congress on Thyroid Cancer, uh, this has been a common theme. Sunday morning remains a popular time to learn about thyroid cancer. So thank you everyone for your participation. It's a great pleasure, a great privilege, and an honor to introduce two people that you've met, I'm sure, many times before, but also um, have heard from on many occasions in the published literature. These are people who are leaders in the field, and it's a, a delight to have uh, Dr. Nikiforov back on the stage again. He's going to be introducing and discussing the concept of the NIFT-P, with which we're all becoming increasingly familiar. And then Dr. Ed Sebus, who really is the driving force behind the development of the Bethesda classification system for reporting cytopathology, is going to give us an update on the new version of Bethesda, which is confusingly known as Bethesda 2. I've always thought Bethesda 2 meant benign, but I'm guessing you're going to educate me in uh, what I'm calling Bethesda version 2.0. So um, let's uh, move ahead then with just a, the briefest of introductions from me. Uh, everyone is familiar with the recommendations from the American Thyroid Association, which are very similar to those of many other professional organizations for the evaluation of thyroid nodules. And those uh, evaluations essentially revolve around good thyroid sonography and excellent thyroid cytopathology with a standard nomenclature in use Bethesda system or something equivalent in uh, countries overseas that may not adopt entirely the Bethesda system. But all of these systems have certain commonalities uh, with a goal to stratify the risk of malignancy within the nodules that we're identifying. And that risk of malignancy stratification begins really with the ultrasound. Dr. Mandel uh, has uh, sat on the panel earlier this week discussing how these patterns of ultrasound are correlated with the risk of malignancy, all the way from a pure cyst, which is always benign, up to uh, 70 to even 90% risk of cancer in certain ultrasound patterns. And so we use these patterns to dictate our decision to uh, perform a fine needle aspiration biopsy, and we use different size thresholds to achieve that. And in our own experience uh, at Moffitt Cancer Center, we've discovered that the ultrasound pattern itself is actually a reasonably accurate predictor of, uh, of uh, risk of malignancy in our hands, with a very low suspicion pattern being associated with only about a 3% chance of cancer. So in fact, for those very low risk nodules, we would argue that a biopsy really is icing on the cake and not strictly necessary. For low risk, intermediate risk, and high risk uh, patterns, there's an increasing risk of malignancy, and those are the ones that we target for our biopsy. And we, of course, apply the Bethesda system, and we try to be very rigorous in that approach, recognizing that uh, a high suspicion of Bethesda 6 is going to be a malignant diagnosis 99% of the time in our hands. A Bethesda 5, in our experience, is more than 85%, although the literature suggests somewhere between uh, 50 and 70% uh, risk of malignancy. Bethesda 1, unsatisfactory, at least we know what to do, repeat the biopsy. And Bethesda 2, benign, very low chance of cancer, safely we can observe those patients. We still struggle with Bethesda 3 and 4, and of course the molecular marker technologies are changing how we approach that, at least in the United States. And again, Dr. Nikiforov really driving that show for us on the, uh, on the genetic um, uh, landscape of uh, thyroid nodules. But that does leave us with a challenge. We still have 150,000 indeterminate cytology results each year in the United States with a malignancy risk somewhere between 15 and 70 percent. It represents a significant clinical challenge and remains the meat of this and many other meetings into the future uh, because of the sheer volume of those diseases. 
And of course, we're seeing an increasing incidence of thyroid cancer. Thyroid cancer is projected to become the number one incident cancer within the next uh, 20 years or so, and the number one prevalent cancer a few years beyond that. So it is going to be overwhelming if we allow this a rise in incidence to continue to occur. And so one of the most exciting things that's going on right now is to take some subset of these so-called thyroid cancers and maybe reclassify them into something that may not truly be a cancer because so many of those cancers, in our experience at least, have been these encapsulated follicular variant of papillary thyroid cancers. When I first arrived in the US and uh, spent time with John Gellner and others at Mayo Clinic in the uh, thyroid pathology lab, these things used to be called adenomas. And the fact that there were some nuclear features that had papillary architecture really didn't phase John Gellner and his colleagues. They still called them benign adenomas. Uh, over the years, that uh, transitioned and changed so that these things started to be defined by their nuclear features and called papillary thyroid cancer. And they were follicular variant papillary cancer fully encapsulated. And that was at least part of the reason we were seeing more and more cancers being diagnosed in our center. And uh, after my transition to Moffitt Cancer Center, we found the same thing. The question is, are these really cancers or are they not? And with that introduction, I'm going to ask Dr. Nikiforov to tell us about this NIFP concept. Thank you, Brian, for uh, inviting me to participate in this sort of uh, interesting session and to set a stage for what I'm going to discuss with during the next 15, uh, 10 to 15 minutes. Um, These are my disclosures. and. Um, I want to start and I apologize for non-pathologists in the audience with some kind of a very sort of busy slide, but I'll, I'll, I'll the, the look at the history of how we've been diagnosing papillary and follicular thyroid cancer. So, but I think it's important. So many years ago, like in the 1950s or so, when the beginning of the modern era of pathology, life was very easy. We had tumors that had papilla and tumors that had follicles. And if this is a papillary tumor, we call it papillary carcinoma. And if it was composed of follicles and had invasion, we call it follicular carcinoma. Life was nice and easy. And tumors that had follicular structures and didn't have papilla doesn't matter whatever nuclear features were uh, of, were counted as follicular carcinomas. Then in the 1980s, situation started to change because we recognize that papillary carcinoma is defined not only by papillary structures, but also by the nuclear features of this tumor. So this uh, tumor that had follicular structures, but nuclear features of papillary carcinoma now started to be diagnosed as papillary carcinomas, not follicular carcinomas. But, but papillary carcinomas are defined only based on the follicular, based now on the nuclear features of papillary carcinoma. So what about the tumors that are completely encapsulated, have no invasion, but have nuclear features of papillary carcinoma? Are they really cancers? So in other words, and this is a very nice review that was published by Giovanni Tallini and others recently in JCNM, show that over the years the criteria shifted from the architecture to nuclear features of papillary carcinoma. But here is a problem, problem for us, for pathologists, because if you think that nuclear features of papillary carcinoma is a binary sort of a parameter, is either present or absent, it's not actually entirely correct, because we see a spectrum of changes. We, in nodules, we see some that have no, clearly no any nuclear features of papillary carcinoma, and some that have well-defined features of papillary carcinoma, nuclear features, and everything in between, the whole spectrum. So the question is where to draw a line, because now we have to diagnose cancer purely based on the nuclear features of papillary carcinoma. This really created a lot of challenges. This has been the most challenging issue for thyroid pathologists for many years. With many papers, this is just one of many, talking about the inter-observer and intra-observer variation among experts in the diagnosis of these lesions. And I can tell you this is not because some pathologists are smart and some are not. This is simply because we had to, to fit a spectrum of changes into a binary distribution, benign or malignant. And that was probably not even, not even appropriate in all, all cases, but that's the reality because clinicians didn't want to hear anything in between. They wanted to say, just tell us, is it benign or is this malignant? So 
this is a review by Dr. Libolsi, Farical pattern uh, tumors of the thyroid, the battle of benign, malignant, and so-called uncertain. So it was really situ very situation in the field where, I mean, I mean, many clinicians were joking, you know, pathologists saying that, you know, you, I have a I have a tumor, I show it to three different pathologists, and they give me four different diagnoses. <laughs> so again, not because we didn't know what how to diagnose it. It was because we had to deal, struggle with these lesions that have some, but not very well developed nuclear features. Are they benign? Are they malignant? In addition, molecular data started to accumulate over the last 15 years, also showing that actually infiltrative and encapsulated follicular variant of papular carcinoma have very different molecular profiles. Encapsulated tumors mostly had RAS, Paxet, PPR gamma, and infiltrative had BRAF, molecular signature of papular carcinoma. There was also difference, so molecular between different type of tumors. Finally, there were some follow-up data already accumulated in the literature, actually showing that when this tumor that we called encapsulated follicular variant of PTC didn't have, inv didn't have invasion, actually the, the, the lo lo short and even long-term follow-up was very, very good. There was no any sort of complications. There was no lymph node metastasis or distant metastasis for these patients. And yet, before the new ATA, uh, ATA sort of guidelines, uh, most patients with encapsulated follicular variant of PTC were treated with completion of thyroidectomy and radioactive iodine therapy. So in a way, like we treat classic, treated classic papular carcinoma. And finally, and Brian also alluded to this, so if we look at the, at the graphs of the increasing incidence of thyroid cancer, although obviously tumors under one CM constitute the largest proportion of the increase, and that's what we are talking about, the detecting very small indolent disease. Actually, tumors larger size, two to five CM, even more than five CM, have also been increasing. And this is obviously a reservoir of also low-risk tumors that, that, that we still were calling cancers. Also, we observe that, 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 that during this transition of, of increase of the, over the last 15 years, we started to diagnose more and more follicular variant PTCs than classic papillary carcinomas. Again, telling us something that we, of the changing way how we were diagnosing these cancers. So, in summary, at, at, by, by early 2013, 2014, we were in the situation when we saw a class of non-invasive neoplasms with variably expressed nuclear features of papillary carcinoma, with genetics that was different from classical papillary, papillary uh, carcinoma, that behave generally in a benign fashion, but we still were diagnosing them as cancer and we were treating them as cancer. And incidence of those so-called cancers was growing. That was the reason why uh, in 2013, uh, serving as the president of the Clinical Pathology Society, I had a, a, a privilege to organize a working group for re-examination of the encapsulated follicular variant of papillary carcinoma. And the goals of that group was to standardize diagnostic microscopic criteria. First of all, we wanted to be sure that all pathologists use the same uniform diagnostic criteria for nuclear features. Uh, to determine molecular profile of these lesions, to assess malignant potential, and if data suggests such, to evaluate possibility of renaming this tumor coming with alternative name for this in, uh, encapsulated follicular variant of PTC. This is a working group that was assembled. I mean, it, first we saw that this as a, as a pure pathological study, so there were 24 pathologists representing from seven different countries in the world. It was really, truly international study, all expert, expert pathologists in the field of thyroid pathology. Then we, we invited uh, uh, two endocrinologists and a thyroid surgeon, Dr. Randolph picture is somewhere here, uh, at this meeting that we had actually here in Boston. That's where the concept of NIFT-P was born in 2014. So uh, we have asked the, the people from different countries and different uh, institutions to contribute to cases that were diagnosed as encapsulated follicular variant of papillary carcinoma, and we collected 268 uh, cases for this study, which uh, were fitted into two groups. One group were non-invasive tumors, 
And second group was the same encapsulated follicular variant of papillary carcinoma, but with invasion. So we were able to unify, standardize diagnostic criteria. I'm not going to abuse you to be going through all this long list of, of criteria, but, but we were very happy that after a number of teleconferences and discussions, all 24 pathologists started to talk the same language. And uh, this is the kind of the main table showing the result of this study. At the end, after cleaning up all cases that were submitted, we had two groups of patients. We had patients with non-invasive encapsulated follicular variant of papillary carcinoma. It was 109 patients. And we have 101 patients with also encapsulated follicular variant PTC, but also but tumors that had some invasion through the capsule or vascular invasion. And in this group, when the, the, the analysis was done blindly, but when then eventually at the, at the consensus conference we un, uh, unveiled the uh, results of follow-up, in the non-invasive group with a mean follow-up of 14 years, there was no recurrences, not structural, no, no biochemical, no any other complications for these patients. In the group of patients with the invasive encapsulated follicular variant of PTC, we have 12 recurrences and two patients, five distant metastases, and patient died of the disease. So we concluded that it's not the nuclear features of PTC, but it's the presence of invasion that makes this patient vulnerable, makes these tumors really grow, metastasize, and eventually hurt the patient. In addition to um, uh, this, our study, we identified about 350 patients reported in the literature already with well-defined criteria with a rate of recurrence less than 1%. So based on this information, based on the real uh, data that we obtained, the group has decided to propose reclassification of these tumors that are clonal processes because they are driven by mutations like RAS, RAS or RAS-like mutations, but if they are non-invasive, and have nuclear features of papillary carcinoma, uh, they would still have a highly favorable outcome with a risk of recurrence less than 1% in 15 years. And the group proposed this nomenclature that I admit sort of is a little bit difficult to roll off your tongue, non-invasive follicular thyroid neoplasm with papillary-like nuclear features or NIFT-E. So the diagnostic criteria for this, uh, uh, for these tumors is encapsulation or clear demarcation of the tumor. The follic exclusively follicular growth pattern should be no papillary structures and presence of uh, nuclear features of papillary carcinoma. The exclusion criteria would be presence of invasion, presence of aggressive histology, necrosis, mitosis, or uh, high proportion of uh, solid uh, trabecular or insular growth pattern. I want to stress two important, very important uh, parameters. It should be no true papillary structure. This is very important because in the current literature, we already started to see uh, some cases that are called NIFT-P with metastasis. In most situations, this is because the papilla were overlooked. Tumor should have no papillary structures. And second important uh, uh, fact is that the entire capsule of the tumor must be examined in order to make this diagnosis. So in those archival cases where the tumor was not fully sampled, this diagnosis cannot be made. Please understand that this is a limitation of the retrospective analysis when somebody asks your pathologist to review slide and say, is it nift p or not? This is also important to realize that prospectively from now on, we, we as pathologists have to very carefully examine of the capsule. The entire capsule has to be examined and only if no invasion is found, this diagnosis can be rendered. So most importantly is that based on the available literature, at least at present time and the results of this study, the group felt comfortable to, 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 to suggest that, at, that if this diagnosis has, is made uh, after very careful pathological examination, it's unlikely this patient would further benefit from completion of thyroidectomy or radioactive iodine therapy. So one, one, one uh, word about uh, cytology, uh, this diagnosis is going to affect 
the prevalence of malignancy in cytological diagnosis. This is a summary of four studies recently published on NIFP. And if you look at this table, you'll see that most of these nodules would be diagnosed by cyto cytology as AUS, FLUS, Bethesda 3, or Bethesda 4, 40%. But smaller proportion, but still some of them will be called suspicious, even malignant by cytology, based on the presence of the nuclear features of papillary carcinoma. So finally, it's important that this tumor have very defined molecular profile. Most of them are driven by RAS. RAS mutations are found in about 30 to 35 percent of NIFTP. Other very common mutations are Paxate PPR gamma fusions and SADA fusions. And uh, with the addition of some new types of SADA fusions that we recently uh, identified. And actually, there's some other additional mutations also present, such as uh, MAC1 mutations recently. So, so most of these tumors are driven by mutations, so they are clonal neoplasms. But these mutations are RAS-like mutations that belong to the low-risk uh, thyroid cancer group. Importantly, NIFP tumors should have no BRAF V600E, no TERT, or other high-risk mutation. If you see this discrepancy, send it back to pathologist, ask to take more slides, more sections in order to, be, to, to, to diagnose these nodules more appropriately. And I want to finish with this question. It is the most common question that I've been uh, receiving by phone, by email, by, by, by angry <laughs> interactions and some meetings. People ask me, why you complicate our lives so, so badly? You know, we, we used to live in a very nice world. It was either benign or malignant, and now need to be, and what should we do with these patients? Is it benign? Is it malignant? And the answer is that, look, I mean, in all other tumors, basically, in all oncology, people are used to multi-step thyroid, uh, uh, multi-step cancer progression. We know in colon cancer that cancer develops with the polyps, tubular adenoma, uh, high-grade uh, high uh, dysplasia, carcinoma inside to cancer. We know in breast that there is a, the DCIS, uh, there is a lobular carcinoma inside, and there is invasive carcinoma. But in thyroid, for some reason, we really were ignoring these intermediate steps, and we saw the tumor is either benign or malignant, and there is no really any link between them. And the answer is that the NIFTP is neither benign nor malignant. This is an intermediate lesion. I mean, if you imagine the tumor goes from benign to malignant in 10 steps, so at 1 to 3 it's benign, and 8, 9, 10 it's malignant, and if it's caught at the stage of 5, 6, 7, this is intermediate stage. It's moving towards the malignancy, it accumulates this additional mutations, but it's not fully malignant. If we catch it at a stage, early pre-invasive stage, and patient is treated and tumor is removed, pretty much the patient is cured in most of the situations. And this is my last slide. I just want to mention that this these tumors have been included in the most recent WHO classification of thyroid of tumors of endocrine organs that was released just one week ago. This is a category 2.2a, non-invasive follicular thyroid neoplasm with papillary-like nuclear features. So it's here to stay, but a lot of more work needs to be done with really adopting this criteria and particularly developing clinical knowledge how really we should manage these patients. Thank you. So elegant summary of uh, where we stand, and of course it's going to raise a number of questions, so if audience members have specific questions, do stand up, shout it out, I will repeat the question because of the audiology in here. Um, but let me start off and just uh, you know, talk through a case. This is a 46-year-old woman with a two and a half centimeter solitary thyroid nodule and no suspicious lateral lymph nodes. Um, the biopsy is performed, and in the Bethesda version one, it was called Bethesda 3, and there was some nuclear atypia with pleomorphism, a little bit of enlargement, and a few nuclear grooves were noted. Not enough to call it a Bethesda 5, but enough to at least label it as atypical with nuclear atypia. And we will come uh, to discuss, I think, the role of nuclear atypia in the interpretation of cytology um, with uh, Dr. Sebus shortly. Um, but uh, Yuri, just thinking about the environment now with NIFP p in the equation, how would you approach this sample at this point in this patient's workup? 
Actually, it's probably a question to add who is a bona fide cytopathologist. <laughs> Uh, do you mean clinically or, or pathologically? Well, first of all, tell me uh, what you think the probability of malignancy would be now that NIFT-P is, is in the equation. Well, I'll, I'll show a slide that actually summarizes our current belief in the risk of malignancy. It, it's on the order of 8 to 15 percent or so now that NIFT-P is no longer considered a quote-unquote uh, carcinoma. And, and Yuri? Yes, I mean, I, I agree. I mean, in our experience, when we see in this sort of uh, basis the three smears with some nuclear features of papillary carcinoma, not very sort of extensive, but, but, but really noticeable, this is a setting where frequently we think about NIFT-P. Just want to stress that NIFT-P still is a surgical disease, and so we, we, we cannot ignore it. We cannot say that it's really truly false positive reading of cytology because this tumors needs to be removed in order to examine capsule and, uh, and confirm this diagnosis. And I think I'd follow up on that by saying that we cannot uh, diagnose NIFT-P on a fine needle aspiration specimen. We are beginning to develop some features that we think raise the possibility of NIFT-P and we're going to be um, looking into that. I think we can suggest the possibility of it on the basis of certain cytologic features, but we're nowhere close yet to, be, to being able to accurately with close to 100% reliability say that this is going to be a NIFT-P. And I, I'm not sure that we'll ever be able to do that because, of course, the defining feature is encapsulation, the absence of invasion, which is a feature that by cytology we certainly can't assess. So what about the molecular profiling of this? Could that help us to identify NIFT-P preoperatively? Yes. I mean, molecularly, this tumor sort of are grouped with the low risk of role risk papillary or follicular carcinomas, which probably many types of management can have similar sort of appearance. Yes, if the molecular testing comes back as positive for us or SAD or Paxa epipergama, there is about 50% chance that this tumor will be nipped uh, after surgery. And do you think that's enough that we should be considering observation in lieu of surgery in the context of something with a Bethesda 3, a little bit of nuclear atypia, a RAS mutant, but no other mutations? Are we ready to say that's going to be a low enough risk that we don't operate? No, absolutely not. I think that this co co combination of findings suggests that this is that, that in, a, in appropriately selected patients, lobectomy should be the most appropriate uh, intervention for these patients. So this patient did have molecular profiling, and uh, we do use the Thyroseq version 2 at Moffat, and uh, it showed a RAS mutation. Uh, there were no other mutations involved in this. Do we know about um, any of the features that drive these things to become invasive yet? Do we understand what goes from a NIFT-P that is a RAS mutant to a follicular variant invasive that is a RAS mutant? We started to understand it. Jim Fagan gave an excellent talk, I mean, two days ago, showing that RAS and EIF1AX, it's a flag. RAS and TERT is obvious flag. RAS and P53 is obvious flag. So there is a secondary hit that would tell us that this is no longer should be considered in this category. If you stay in this pure RAS mutation, there is no any other alterations on a large panel, we should think about low risk tumor until proven otherwise. So this concept of adenoma to carcinoma sequence was one that was very common in the follicular thyroid cancer field for many, many years. We always believed that a follicular adenoma had some small degree of uh, transition to a follicular thyroid carcinoma. Do we have any idea what the rate of transition might be from a NIFT-P to an invasive? Is, have we, is there any way to get a handle on that? It's a very difficult uh, uh, question, and I can tell you again, analogy would be if somebody asks, what is the rate of, of transition of breast ductal carcinoma in situ into invasive carcinoma? We really don't know. We know that it exists, but we don't know. To define it will be very difficult, So, but we believe that there is, certain, there is, there is, some, there is some risk of them to become malignant tumors. Uh, at, invasive tumors, even based on our uh, studies that we published in German Oncology, because tumors that look exactly the same, but a significant proportion of them had already invasion, and those tumors are bona fide cancers. So one more question, and you've alluded to this already, the need to really look at the entire tumor, inspecting for both papillary-like features within it, papillary features within it, papillae. 1% uh, was the threshold you spoke about. 
1% was a threshold that we gave with Dr. Livolsi and, the, and others at this consensus conference, but we realize now that this is misused. This 1% is used as justification to call troop a pillar as still need P. We are revising, we are actually working with, with, with number of thought leaders in the audience on the sort of editorials and several kind of, a, kind of additional publications where we will say that it should be no papillary structures within the tumors that are called NIFTP. So this one is a nice small tumor, but some of them are going to be pretty large. How about a five or six centimeter one? How many sections do you need to look at to exclude the one papilla and right. the tiniest invasion through a capsule? This is an excellent question, and in general, I mean, I also frequently ask, what about large nodules, four, five, six CM that are come back as NIFT P? How reliable do you do you feel that it's still safe to observe them? We have some information. There is a recent paper published from Ronnie Gassain Group at Memorial showing that actually about 40, 45 patients with long follow-up showing that large tumors, more than four CM that the outcome was very similar, was very low grade. Nevertheless, this is obvious issue that should alert, I mean, should keep sort of all clinicians in the room kind of thinking, because if you're talking about the 6, 7 CM tumor, you need to put 60, 70 sections to fully examine this. And some pathologists will just, just tell you that they are not going to go through such amount of work to, to, to examine this tumor. But then there is a philosophical question. Should we label some, somebody with cancer because we just, it's just too much work for pathologists to do it? It's also kind of doesn't sound right, correct? So, but obviously, when you have large nodules, you have to be particularly careful to be sure that the right criteria were applied. So what we're going to do, I think, is to move on now to uh, Dr. Seba's presentation, and then we've got another case to discuss around that, and then I will open this up for discussion of the audience. So Dr. Sebus, thank you. Well, thank you very much to Dr. McIver and Dr. Randolph for inviting me to be here. It's a pleasure to address this audience and give you a bit of a sneak peek at the upcoming uh, second ed edition of the thyroid Bethesda system. Um, let me start by saying that, um, you know, it's important to remember that about 10 years ago we lived in a time of, of chaos in terms of terminology in the United States. We had no uh, standard terminology for reporting thyroid fine needle aspiration specimens. Um, there were laboratories that were quite happy with the terminologies that they used, but we were very much siloed in this country. And uh, there was a general consensus that we needed to develop a more standardized terminology, which we've done. Uh, it's given us the benefits of a clarity of communication with our clinical colleagues and with each other as cases get passed from one pathology department to another. It's also allowed for the exchange of information across institutions because now we are, for the most part, speaking, I think, the same language. It's been pretty widely accepted in the United States. Um, there are other terminologies in other countries. There's a, an Italian terminology, and there's a British terminology, and there's an Australian terminology. Uh, but these are very much um, interchangeable, I guess, in the sense there are um, commonalities between them, and it's very easy to convert uh, from one of these uh, terminologies to another. Uh, the Bethesda system has been endorsed by the American Thyroid Association, which essentially recommends that thyroid cytopathology in the US uh, be reported using the categories of the Bethesda system. Uh, but things never stay the same. There have been advances, uh, both in molecular testing and in histopathologic terminology, as we just heard from Dr. Nikki Forov, that have very significant uh, implications for cytology interpretation and classification. So we took advantage of uh, an international congress that took place in Yokohama last year to put together a symposium uh, and the question that was uh, um, put forth to that symposium was what, uh, what has worked so far, what can we keep, and what should we uh, consider changing uh, in developing a second edition of the Bethesda system. Uh, so there was a steering committee uh, that consisted of Dr. Bill Faquin, Mark Pushtasheri, and Esther Diana Rossi. Um, we had uh, some pretty prominent thought leaders that were the members of the symposium and they were tasked with doing a literature review and coming up with draft recommendations which they published in Acta Cytologica shortly after the Yokohama conference and the title page of that is shown here. And it was essentially the recommendations of this Yokohama symposium that formed the basis for the second edition of the Bethesda system. 
So there will be a second edition of our little blue book. It will be out in October of this year. So just a few months from now, I've just gotten the page proofs with uh, Dr. Sayed Ali, uh, and we are hoping to get through those in the next week or so, uh, so that this can be very much in press and out by the fall of this year. So um, you're familiar with the six categories, uh, and I'm going to read them out loud anyway, because um, I want to make a few points about this uh, Bethesda system. The first category is non-diagnostic or unsatisfactory. The second category is benign, and I think one of the great advances of the Bethesda system is that it has reinforced to our clinical colleagues and to ourselves that it is perfectly uh, reliable given the appropriate cytomorphologic features to make a definite diagnosis of benignity on a fine needle aspiration specimen. There is a pattern uh, that is recognizable that has a virtually zero probability of being malignant, and we as cytopathologists should feel comfortable making that interpretation. The third category is atypia of undetermined significance or follicular lesion of undetermined significance. The fourth category is follicular neoplasm or suspicious for follicular neoplasm. Fifth, suspicious for malignancy. And the sixth category is malignant. Now, there are for three of these categories a choice of two names. And why is that? That's a, a somewhat unique feature of this classification. That's because at the Bethesda Conference at the National Cancer Institute, we simply could not come up with a consensus on just a single name for three of these categories. And so we have offered the cytopathology community a choice of, uh, to choose between one of those categories. But these names are intended to be synonymous, and you should not be using, for example, AUS and FLUS to mean two different things. And that's something that we're going to emphasize in the second edition of the Bethesda system. So I think you know that this has worked primarily because each of these categories has an associated risk of malignancy, which then allows you to make a rational clinical management decision. And that so-called usual management is shown in the column on the right uh, and has been pretty much followed um, by uh, our clinical colleagues. Of course, it is individualized, and there are a variety of situations where the sonographic features may play an important role, or even the patient's own desires for treatment can impact. But I think it's safe to say that the cytologic interpretation is often the single most important determinant of patient management, or has been so far, uh, and that's been a great strength uh, of this system. So how is the second edition going to change? How is it going to look different compared to the original Bethesda system? So here is the familiar original Bethesda system. And in the next slide, I will show you the new terminology. So obviously, <laughs> it's not going to change. <laughs> the, um, the Yokohama. That's uh, the end of that talk. <laughs> I'm hoping you'll be pleased by that. Um, the Yokohama Symposium members did not really see any essential need for us to really change the names of these categories. So that's not where the changes are going to take place. The changes are really going to be in the associated risks of malignancy. The recent literature has suggested that some of those numbers need to be reevaluated. So you'll see a, some, I think, fairly significant changes for some of those categories. Uh, and also because of the um, at, you know, implementation of molecular testing in this country, we have to make some uh, allocations for the usual management column. So I'm going to focus the last few minutes of my presentation uh, on these changes that you'll see in the Bethesda system. And I'm just going to highlight a few of them. So for the category that's AUS or FLUS, again, these are meant to be synonymous terms, and so the laboratory should choose the one term which they prefer and use it exclusively for that category. In our lab, we prefer the term AUS, but there are other laboratories that use FLUS instead. Uh, this is really the same category. Uh, so I think there was a general consensus that the original risk of malignancy that was estimated to be between 5 and 15 percent was a bit of an underestimate. The newer literature suggested that it was somewhere more in the order of 10 to 30 percent. But we now know uh, that an, um, a, a good proportion of the malignancies that comprise this AUS or FLUS category are going to be now reclassified as NIFT-P. So although we're raising the risk of malignancy to 10 to 30 percent, we're now also simultaneously lowering it because of the reclassification of NIFT-P. 
Uh, and this is just um, a, t um, a chart that summarizes two studies which have looked at the impact that reclassifying NIFT-P would have on um, the Bethesda risks of malignancy. And the biggest impacts are on, of course, our three indeterminate categories, because most of the NIFT-Ps uh, are not called malignant. Uh, they're usually called either AUS plus, suspicious for follicular neoplasm, or suspicious for malignancy. Uh, the other changes, uh, there, we, we did have an original benchmark that recommended that laboratories try to limit the number of cases that they call AUS or FLUS. That was originally 7%. We've discovered that um, many laboratories had uh, some trouble um, complying with that recommendation. Uh, so we now are being a little bit more generous, uh, for better or for worse, and have decided to recommend that this category should be no more than 10% uh, of all the thyroid FNAs that are interpreted. And of course, uh, now molecular testing is widely used to help triage patients to either conservative management or to lobectomy, and so we had to incorporate molecular testing in the usual management algorithm. Suspicious for follicular neoplasm or follicular neoplasm, uh, we're making a slight change to the diagnostic criteria here. So in the original definition, if you had nuclear features of papillary carcinoma, uh, that case was excluded from suspicious for follicular neoplasm. But now, with the recognition of NIFT-P, we are allowing some mild nuclear features of papillary carcinoma, uh, so long as it's a predominantly microfollicular or exclusively microfollicular specimen, um, because in a certain sense, we w will not be unhappy if some of these lesions turn out to have a lobectomy as opposed to a total thyroidectomy, which is the usual management for this category. We're also recommending the consideration of an optional note um, it, that you can append to the suspicious for follicular neoplasm interpretation that simply mentions that um, this diagnosis may turn out to be a follicular adenoma, a follicular carcinoma, or a follicular variant of PTC, including its indolent variant, NIFT-P. And in our lab, we have started using this so-called NIFT-P note um, for this category, and I'll show you a, a, a couple of other examples. Uh, again, we're making a, a slight change, but not a very big one to the risk of malignancy for this category. Uh, and again, molecular testing is impacting uh, the management here, so we have to modify our usual management for this category. How about Bethesda 5, suspicious for malignancy? Uh, again, um, recent developments have uh, uh, caused um, a reassessment of the risk of malignancy with this category, and I'll show you a table that summarizes all of these at the end of the presentation. Um, again, if you, for a subset of these cases, if you suspect a follicular variant of papillary thyroid carcinoma, we're recommending consideration of an optional note, again, that, that raises the possibility that suggests that this actually may be a follicular variant of papillary carcinoma or its indolent counterpart, NIFT-P. Again, the idea here is because uh, our clinical colleagues have a choice in management for this category between lobectomy and total thyroidectomy, there's a subset of cases that we think may benefit from a lobectomy more than from a total thyroidectomy. So we're trying to suggest to our clinical colleagues with this particular subset uh, that a lobectomy might uh, be considered over total thyroidectomy because we think that this has features of a follicular variant of PTC or NIFT-P. And finally, we're making a slight change to the diagnostic criteria um, for the category malignant. Um, a, number of, a number of pathologists have been quite frightened by the advent of NIFT-P, and uh, I've heard people say, how can I ever call anything malignant anymore um, now that um, NIFT-P is no longer a malignancy and yet it has nuclear features of papillary carcinoma? We're now recommending that you limit the malignant category to a case that has the features of classic papillary thyroid carcinoma. In other words, a case that has papillae, a case that has somoma bodies, a case that has numerous intranuclear inclusions, and to exclude cases that don't have these features. If something looks like it really is essentially a follicular variant of PTC, probably better not to put that in the malignant category, but to call that suspicious for malignancy. And I actually think that most pathologists 
cytopathologists have already been doing that. I think it's been relatively uncommon that follicular variants of PTC with those mild nuclear features are actually being called malignant. Uh, but now we're sort of codifying that and suggesting that because of NIFT-P, consider using the malignant category. You can still have a malignant category, but limit it to the cases that have features of classic papillary carcinoma. Again, if you want to put an educational note that now says there's a small chance that this may lead to a NIFT-P histologically, we're recommending the particular terminology for that educational note. Um, now the American Thyroid Association is also recommending consideration of conservative management, even for the malignant diagnosis if the nodule is less than four centimeters and if there's no evidence of lymph node metastases. So we have to now include lobectomy as an option for this category, uh, which it really wasn't 10 years ago with the original Bethesda system. Uh, so here are the revised risks of malignancy. Um, in the middle column are the risks of malignancy if NIFT-P is no longer considered a carcinoma. Um, but in the second edition, we're going to still include a column that has the risks of malignancy should NIFT-P not be considered a malignancy. And why are we doing that? I think that this middle column is a little bit misleading in terms of clinical management because as has been mentioned here earlier, NIFT-P is still a surgical diagnosis. It still needs to be resected and so I think in reality the numbers that make more clinical sense are the numbers in the right hand column where NIFT-P is actually still considered, if you will, a surgical disease. It's a bit of a complicated assessment, but we thought that this was the best compromise that we could come up with. So here's the modification to the usual management in the middle column were the original usual management associations. And on the right, I've highlighted the changes, the introduction of molecular testing as an important aspect of clinical management for AUS or FLUS and for suspicious for follicular neoplasm or follicular neoplasm. And for the suspicious for malignancy or Bethesda 5 category, there's an asterisk there um, that uh, references the American Thyroid Association recommendation that uh, either BRAF testing or the seven gene panel might be considered if it might uh, impact or influence the decision between lobectomy or total thyroidectomy for a Bethesda 5 interpretation. Uh, so let me uh, finish here with this one uh, simple summary slide. Um, uh, there will be a revised classification uh, later this, uh, this year. No major changes, uh, some revised malignancy risks, um, revised usual management associations, some slightly modified criteria for two of our categories, and a big thank you to everybody who participated in the Yokohama panel. Thank you very much. So thank you, Dr. Sebus, um, for uh, tour de force there. That's uh, uh, you know a huge amount of work, a huge amount of effort to get these consensus groups to really reach a consensus and come up with recommendations that are not only meaningful scientifically but really meaningful clinically. So I do, of course, have a few um, uh, questions for you. Um, my first one really is directed, I think, to Dr. Nikiforov. Um, seven gene panel, Yuri recommended as part of this and endorsed <laughs> by, the, uh, by the Bethesda group. Well, that's, yeah, uh, I mean, that's a little, a little tricky. I understand why this was formulated that way, because probably referring to the ATA exactly guidelines, right. That's right. Yeah. which we have sort of issued already two years ago. For example, it would miss third mutation, I mean, and other very important mutations that really would, would push it to total thyroid. No, no, we're still in proofs, Yuri, so I can still probably. <laughs> <laughs> I would not limit it. I probably yeah. would make more sense not to limit, just say in a little bit more general M way. More this. general. Very more good. Ge because uh, we can certainly do that. It will eliminate a high risk mutations that w would be very strong indication for total thyroid. But do you think there's still a role for mutational testing in yes, general? I mean, absolutely, it, right. yes. But I mean, not limited to seven gene pairs. So my comment around that is, of course, the, the previous iteration of the Bethesda guidelines has served us well for a decade. 
And this next version, it's likely going to be another decade before we come up with some major reclassification. Mm -hmm. And of course, over the next decade, we anticipate all of the molecular technologies to evolve very significantly. So if we can at least keep the, those, uh, you know, keep it forward looking rather than, than backward looking in general sense, then certainly I would favor it. And I'm interested in the audience's comments. So. Um, so let me just talk through a case because there's a few other questions I want to get to that may arise from this case. This is a 42-year-old with a two-centimeter palpable thyroid nodule. Uh, the ultrasound appearance there is um, certainly uh, uh, falls under the high suspicion category of the American Thyroid Association, and she has normal thyroid function. Um, the cytopathology shows uh, once again a Bethesda three classification with some nuclear pleomorphism and a few grooves and a little bit of clearing in the nuclei here and there. Um, under the new Bethesda system, would this still be called a Bethesda 3? Uh, well, without reviewing the entire slide, <laughs> assuming that this image is representative, sure. I, I'll t I, I, I have no trouble agreeing with that interpretation. In some areas, um, there's been a distinction made, at least in certain uh, labs, between an AUS, atypia of unknown significance, and a follicular lesion of unknown significance. Some people even uh, start to subclassify a 3A and a 3B, for example, right. based on the nuclear atypia. And I wonder if your group kind of struggled with whether to include nuclear atypia in this uh, new system or to, uh, you know, deliberately exclude right. it. Right. Uh, so, the, uh, yeah, let me speak to that. So. Um, as I mentioned, we are, we, we take um, responsibility for perhaps the original Bethesda system not being very clear on the fact that AUS and FLUS are synonyms. Uh, we are going to make that a lot more clear um, with the second edition. So we are going to be encouraging laboratories that have been using AUS and FLUS to mean two different things, to make a choice between one or the other and use that exclusively for that category. As far as subclassifying AUS or FLUS into uh, cytologic or architectural atypia, we are going to be encouraging labs to do that. Um, however, there is no clear management distinction between that. So we're encouraging it because we'd like to study that further. We are going to allow for some slight nuclear changes in the AUS or FLUS category. Um, and our general recommendation will be to subclassify AUS or FLUS into either cytologic atypia, which is nuclear atypia, architectural atypia, both, or Herthel cell, quote unquote, atypia. It's not really Herthel cell cytologic atypia, but there is a subset of cases that will fall into AUS or FLUS because of, you know, a, pr a prominence of Herthel cell changes. Uh, so yes, we're recommending subclassification, but not because we believe we're ready yet to recommend a difference in management for those subclasses. I'm, I'm glad to know that that is being encouraged. Um, uh, Pablo Valderabano in our group has done some work, um, you know, looking at the literature, a meta-analysis of this, and really demonstrating, I think, very powerfully that when it comes to predicting a malignancy, the nuclear atypia is a very a powerful feature. Correct. To your point, the recommendations for a thyroid lobectomy don't necessarily change, right. but many people are currently using a Bethesda th three. With, with or without nuclear atypia right. to make a decision not to operate on a patient, to use molecular markers to decide not to operate. If you start off with the nuclear atypia at the beginning of that, your pretest probability of malignancy is much higher. It may make the negative predictive value of the molecular tests lower as a consequence and impact on that decision. I think that's correct. I, I think the, the underlying problem with this whole discussion, I think, though, is that it's really hard to get an accurate sense for the risk of malignancy for the AUS or FLUS category. The reality is that most of those nodules are not resected. Uh, and so we're making our assumptions, our conclusions based on a subset of cases that undergo surgical resection in a sense almost despite the cytologic interpretation, either because they have an abnormal molecular test result or they have some unusual sonographic features. And, uh, and so I think we're, we're hampered by um, not having a really, I think, excellent sense for what the risk of malignancy. It always has to be in, extrapolated uh, from data that are flawed uh, because there's so much selection bias in which cases go to surgery, which ones don't. 
I guess also the question would be how reproducible is atypia between, oh, right. between different psychologies? Yeah, well, so, so, the, so that's the skeleton in the closet. The reality is you, you talked about reproducibility in surgical pathology, which is a problem. And we have the same, if not a greater problem, in cytopathology. Uh, I've actually published myself um, and shown that you show an AUS to one pathologist and it's somebody else's benign or suspicious for papillary carcinoma. So. Uh, there is a tremendous amount of uh, lack of reproducibility with these categories, especially for the indeterminate categories, not so much with benign or malignant. And just to uh, amplify one point that I think you made very valuably, many of our studies looking at risk of malignancy are fundamentally flawed studies because of the decision made to not operate on the ones that we claim to be benign or very Correct. low risk. Right. And of course, that flaw began back in the 1980s when we introduced fine needle aspiration biopsy because nobody really, to my knowledge at least, did the study um, to demonstrate the sensitivity and specificity of a fine needle aspiration cytology. Uh, we hold our molecular marker colleagues to somewhat higher standards than that, although again, I think we have a tendency perhaps as a group within endocrinology not to push that issue hard enough, that if we're going to introduce new technologies, new tests, we should really understand the sensitivity and specificity before we roll it out to the community as a whole. Um, this particular case uh, was uh, uh, checked by two molecular studies. One, uh, Affirma, was suspicious, and the other, Thyroseq version 2, was BRAF V600E. Um, would either of those influence your decision, Yuri, to offer this patient a lobectomy versus a total thyroidectomy? Well, I mean, we had, I think, discussion here in this forum already about BRAF v 600 e Some feel that this is still, we don't have sufficient data to put it in intermediate risk. Although, in general, BRAF v 600 e diagnosis is a uh, uh, 99.9 percent .9 probability of cancer, and typically, unless this is less than one CM nodule, and this is seems like not, it's an intermediate risk group. It's not a low risk, so probably total steroid. You would push you towards the total. Can we have a show of hands after the Congress today? Uh, how many of the attendees this morning would offer this patient with a two centimeter? BRAF positive but cytologically indeterminate uh, thyroid nodule, total thyroidectomy, hands for a total thyroidectomy. And what uh, audience members would offer a thyroid lobectomy to this patient? So interesting, it's uh, probably a 50-50 split or slightly in favor of the minimalist procedure. Uh, anybody in the room who would suggest continued observation in lieu of surgery? So everyone's going for a surgery, but the slight majority going for a lobectomy. What a transformation in the eight years since the World Congress first came into being. Because if I had asked this question eight years ago about an almost certain papillary cancer, I think everybody in this group would have said total thyroidectomy, central neck dissection, radioactive iodine. So the field of thyroid cancer and thyroid nodules has undergone a dramatic transformation over the, t uh, the last decade, and it's thanks in large part to people like our panelists today and the panelists throughout the World Congress on this occasion, to which I offer my intense and humble gratitude. Thank you very much indeed for your participation today. Now, we do have about two minutes. If anybody has a burning question, come and ask that question right away. Yes, there's a question right back there. You'll have to shout really loudly. So I'll just repeat the question. If a patient has a NIFT PE diagnosed following a lobectomy, uh, how should that patient be followed? Because they're neither benign nor malignant. They're basically Schrodinger's cat. So do we follow them as benign or do we follow them as malignant? So I think that while we are still accumulating sort of this is a relatively new entity, we should follow this patient as a low risk cancer, as a really minimally invasive low risk cancer, which we have to follow, but not completion thyroidectomy, not radioactive iodine. My yeah, so my response to that question when a patient asks me is that I remind them about uh, Mr. Reagan negotiating with the Russians. Yuri, you'll enjoy this. Uh, he said, we should trust but verify. So we trust it's benign, but verify that it behaves in a benign way. One more question, then we have to finish. Uh, 
And the question is, if you record these in your tumor registry, and do we record them as malignant or benign? This is an excellent question, and when we were putting together a, a WHO, uh, inserting it into WHO classification, we were talking about LCD codes, and we, we, we coded it as a carcinoma in situ. So this, this, this may not get into the official cancer registry, but should be captured as a, as a kind of a, as we capture like breast carcinoma in situ and so on, so as an in situ tumor. Wonderful. Well, again, thank you to our two panelists this morning. Thank you to the audience for your attendance and participation. Wonderful. Thank you.